Hey guys, today we're going to dig even deeper into our ecology unit and we're going to start talking about communities and also um, ecosystems. So if you'll pull out your notes, we're on page 8. Um, whenever we talk about communities, we're actually talking about symbiotic relationships. A symbiotic relationship is a direct or indirect interaction between two different species. So a good example of this includes you and your cat. Okay, not you and your boyfriend or you and your girlfriend or your mom and your dad because you guys are the same species. But you and your cat because you depend on your cat for love and cuddles and affection. And your cat depends on you to be fed. Now there are several different types. The first type is parasitism. This is when one species benefits while another is harmed. So we call this a plus minus relationship or a smiley frowny relationship. So here we see parasitism. We see a, um, I believe this is a heart with some heartworms in it. So this is probably from a dog. Now this is another type of parasitism, but it's actually its own special thing. This is actually predation. Predation is a source of parasitism where one species hunts another as a source of food. Okay, with the heartworms, the heartworms don't want to kill the dog because if they do, then they don't have anything to eat. Whereas in predation, um, an organism is actually going to be hunted and then eaten as food. Then we have competition. This is when both species use the same resource at the same time. It's a minus-minus or a frowny-frowny relationship. So this could be something as simple as two birds who eat the same type of seeds. Um, it could also be like this kudzu here. If you look, you can see that this kudzu has grown up over these trees. Now, they're both competing because they both want what? Sunlight. Now, if they can't get the sunlight, what happens to the trees underneath the kudzu? They die. Um, there are two types of competition. There's competition, competitive, competitive <laughs> exclusion and also resource partitioning. In competitive exclusion, we're going to see um, where one species is going to outcompete the other. So here we see some um, thalamus uh, barnacles, okay, and some balanus barnacles. And you'll notice that if we remove the thalamus barnacles, these balanus barnacles do really well. Same thing if we remove the balanus, then the thalam thalamus are going to do really well. In resource partitioning, the organisms are going to share the resources. So if you notice, we have these really big trees, but then we also have these smaller trees. And the reason that they're smaller is because these bigger trees are being allotted a lot more nutrients. Now, commensalism is a type of symbiosis that's really hard for people to remember what the actual word is. But it's simply when one species benefits and the other appears to be ineffective or unaffected. So we call this a plus null relationship or a smiley and mm, indifferent relationship. My favorite example of this is a spider web or a spider up in a tree. The spider builds this web way up high in the tree so that the flying insects can land in it. And that doesn't hurt or harm the tree. Another example is this elephant. This elephant as he walks along he's actually causing bugs to jump up out of the grass and along come birds that are going to eat those bugs. Well, it doesn't hurt the elephant, it doesn't harm the elephant, but because the elephant is walking through this grass and kicking up the bugs, the bird is getting something out of it. Another example is um, there are certain fish who like to swim underneath sharks. Okay, the shark doesn't eat the fish, it doesn't really care about the fish, but the fish are getting protected. Then we have mutualism. This happens when both species benefit. We call it a plus-plus relationship or a smiley-smiley. Here we see Nemo living in his anemone. I sure do talk about anemones a lot. Um, in his anemone, Nemo is getting protection and the anemone is getting cleaned because um, Nemo eats the stuff that grows on the anemone. We also see a bee with a flower. Um, this bee is getting fed and the flower is being pollinated. So here's a sweet little um, funny joke for you just to, you know, make you happy today. Now let's move on and talk about ecosystems. Basically here we're going to talk about how do all the factors interact with one another. 
So the first thing that we're going to look at is what do we see here in this pond? We see some producers, okay, some rooted plants. We see some other producers, some phytoplankton. Then we see probably some zooplankton here that's a primary consumer, a secondary consumer, and a tertiary consumer. Okay, tertiary means three. It's just the third thing. Then we also see some decomposers. Now, just a reminder, an ecosystem is all the living and non-living stuff in an area. Um, so in an ecosystem, we have a community. This is all the biotic factors. We have the habitat, all the abiotic factors. There's always a transfer of energy and a cycling of materials. Now, there are two types of organisms. There are autotrophs. If we break down this word, auto means self. Troph means food or energy. So these guys make their own food or energy, usually through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. We're going to talk a lot more about that in the third unit. Um, and we call them producers. If you think about it, um, all the stuff that we find in the produce section of our grocery store is something that's an autotroph. Okay, It's some type of plant. And then we have heterotrophs. Hetero means other. Okay, these are things that have to eat their food. You and I are heterotrophs. We can't make our own food. Even if we do go home and cook spaghetti tonight, we're still not making our own food. Okay, we are taking food that's already been made, or we're taking plants or other animals, and we're cooking them up and putting them together. We're called consumers. Now, there's a connection between autotrophs and heterotrophs. If you take a look here, we see that carbon dioxide has to go into a plant in order for the plant to put out oxygen. The plant also puts out sugars that we eat. Um, then that oxygen is taken in by us and it's used through a process called cellular respiration. We add that oxygen with the food that we eat from the plants and we put out carbon dioxide, which the plant then uses. And when we do this, um, we're calling these two things photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Now, if we take a look here, we see a food chain. This is just when there's just one path for the energy to follow. So we start with a producer, we move on to the caterpillar or the consumer, which is then eaten by the frog, which is eaten by the snake, and then the owl. Or if we want to make it a little bit bigger, we start with the sun. Okay, the sun is the source of all energy here on Earth. And that sun goes into the producers of the algae, which are then eaten by the mosquito larva, which are eaten by the dragonfly larva, which are eaten by the perch, which are eaten by the pike, and hopefully this man isn't going to be telling big fish tales about how big that fish is that he caught. Hopefully he's going to catch this pike and take it home for dinner. Now, the directions of the arrows are always going to show which direction the energy is transferred. So if we go back here, we see the energy is leaving the sun and going into the algae. Same thing here, it's leaving the algae and going into the mosquitoes. So make sure whenever you draw a food chain that you're always drawing these arrows pointing towards whatever is eating or consuming that energy. Now we always start with the autotroph or producer because energy always starts with them because they're the only things that can take in that energy from the sun and turn it into an energy that we can use. Then we always end with decomposers because those decomposers are going to take back all the dead stuff and change it into nutrients that those producers can use. Now, food chains are really simple, but we all know that this man could eat not just the pike, but the perch, okay, if he really wants to. I guess he could eat the dragonfly larva and the mosquito larva. So whenever people eat from or something eats from two or more food chains, we call that a food web. So if you look here, you can see how this looks kind of like a web, okay? So we see the herbivorous insects are going to be eaten by the spiders and the insectivorous birds and the predaceous insects and the snakes. So the energy is being transferred to more than one type of organism. Now, there are different types of organisms that we're going to talk about. The first is producers. We've already covered this. We also call them autotrophs, and they use the sun or chemical energy to make their own food. Then, there are several types of consumers. The first is herbivores. Vor means to eat. Herbi means plants, so they only eat plants. Carnivores. Carni means meat. Vor means to eat, so they only eat meat. And omnivores are what you and I are. 
Okay, even if you're a vegetarian, you are technically an omnivore because that's what our bodies are made to do. Yes, you can find protein and other nutrients through plant matter, but you are still classified as an omnivore. Um, omni means both, so you're going to eat both plants and animals. Then finally, we have the decomposers. They're going to consume dead plants and animals, species, etc. Now, whenever we talk about these things, we're going to talk about different trophic levels. A trophic level is a, a feeding level or an energy level. Okay, so if you look, the producers are always going to be the first trophic level. It's going to move to primary consumers, secondary, um, tertiary, that means three, quaternary means four, I could go on all day. Um, but the decomposers are kind of their own special level because they can eat at each of these levels. Whenever something dies, they take it in. Whenever we um, talk about these trophic levels, we put them in a pyramid and notice that the producers start at the bottom. I want you to think about why that might be. Why is it that we use a triangle or a pyramid instead of a square to draw out what our um, trophic levels look like? Maybe this caterpillar image will give you an idea. Just so you know, joules is a unit of energy. That's what that capital J right there is. So have you figured out yet? Not all the energy is transferred between trophic levels. So only 10% gets moved along. Okay, the non-transferable energy um, is used by the organism as body heat or metabolism. Um, it could be the inedible parts, the hair, the fur, the bones. So if we take a look here, if this plant produces 10,000 joules of energy, well, there's only going to be a thousand joules of energy available for this grasshopper. So we can't have a whole bunch of grasshoppers trying to eat this because then the grasshoppers aren't going to get enough energy. Now, I will tell you the easiest way to do this math. We're just going to know that there is a decimal here. We're going to move it to the left or to the right. So which way did the decimal get moved right here? In order to make a thousand into a hundred, we just moved the decimal one place to the left. So you notice that there's less and less energy available at each trophic level. Now that means that there's going to be a lower carrying capacity. Remember that's the size of a population that can be supported by the ecosystem. So the lower the carrying capacity, the smaller the population size. And whenever we talk about this, we have to include biomass. And if you think about what mass is, it's basically just the amount of stuff. Okay, so biomass is the number of organisms that we find in each trophic level. Um, now we move on and we talk about bioaccumulation. So think about what it means to accumulate. Maybe you've accumulated some really good grades in this class or some not so great grades. That's okay, we can work on it. Um, bioaccumulation or biomagnification, think about magnification, it means to get bigger. These are toxins that don't break down, so lead and mercury. And as we move up the trophic levels, they're going to increase. And the reason why is if we say that each of these dots represents a phytoplankton that has eaten mercury. Okay, we know that this fish has to eat more than one phytoplankton. So let's say that he's eaten two. So now he has two units of mercury in his belly. Well, then he gets eaten by this fish. Well, this fish couldn't just eat one of him. He needed to eat two of him. Okay, another fish just like this one so that he would have a full belly. So he ends up with now four pieces of mercury or units of mercury. And then this big fish, because he's bigger, he needs to eat a lot more of these guys. So he ends up with eight units of mercury. Well, then if this guy comes along, he's going to eat a lot more than one fish. So he's going to end up with even more of this mercury in his belly. So that mercury doesn't get passed on through your waist. It doesn't get passed on um, through your body. Your body doesn't use it. It just builds up there in your body. Here's another example. We see this algae. Okay, This algae takes in some um, mercury. The shrimp takes in a lot more mercury. The cod takes in even more. The ringed seal takes in a lot more cod. And then the polar bear has to eat a lot more ringed seal. So that's something that we're going to talk about more in class. So hopefully you'll get a better understanding. I know bioaccumulation is hard to understand. But hopefully by the end of this unit, you're going to have a pretty good grasp on it. 
Now, um, if you have any questions, make sure that you let me know. Um, and also, I wanted to let you guys know that I've given you a lot of your vocab during these notes, so make sure that you go back and fill out that vocab so that you don't have to look it up later. As you see here, our next